Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for, for being here. Thank you uh, to Anand for the invitation to me to, to chair this, this event, uh, this panel. So my name is Jennifer Rankin. I'm the Brussels correspondent for The Guardian. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning and, and introduce this excellent panel, our first panel of the day. And I, I really do like the, uh, the, the uh, program for today's event. So we'll be looking at Brexit uh, past, present, and future. So if you like, uh, uh, think of this as the, uh, the ghost of Brexit past. <laughs> we will try to throw some lights on there, the turning points, the tribulations, the mistakes, the missteps, and the might have beens of the last two years, being, of course, exactly two years since Article 50 was triggered, a, a day that I'm sure we all remember very well. But it's a chance not only to think about the, the nitty-gritty of the negotiations of the last two years, but also the bigger, I think, historical sweep of how did we get here and what were the assumptions on both sides behind the, the negotiations. So I will introduce our panel. There is um, one absence, in, in a sense, on this panel, because uh, I know uh, the programme organisers hope very much to have someone from the British government on this panel, and that absence is not... Uh, uh, it was not a deliberate choice, uh, but we will. Um, so we, we don't have anyone from the government this morning. But of course, if you're, if we have people from DexEU or the Cabinet Office or any other department in the audience, then please, uh, please do put your hand up in the question and answer session to make your, to make your point. And indeed, we will have time for questions and answers. So I'll be coming to the audience uh, in a little while. So please do uh, prepare your your questions for our panelists. But let me introduce who we do have today. So uh, starting at, uh, at the left, on my left, uh, we have uh, Stefan de Rink, who is chief advisor, one of the chief advisors to the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier. Uh, he's worked now at the Commission for 24 years and has worked quite closely with, uh, with Mr. Barnier for, for some time. So not only during Mr. Barnier's role as Brexit negotiator, but also when he was... Uh, Commissioner for Financial Services. Uh, then we have, uh, we have uh, skip to the middle, we have uh, Sarah Hyerman, who is Associate Professor of European Politics at the London School of Economics. Uh, Sarah has published very widely on European politics and policy, and she takes a particular interest in transparency and accountability, which I think will be very pertinent today. And then finally, we have two of the leading Brexitologists uh, of the media. So we have uh, Peter Foster, uh, who is Europe editor at the Daily Telegraph. And we also have Faisal Islam, uh, to my left, who is political editor of Sky News, but will be heading off to the, the BBC, I understand. I'm leaving on April the 12th. Yes. <laughs> so he's planned a, a very timely uh, exit. Exit. <laughs> Yes, a Frexit. Okay, well, without any further ado, let me, let me hand over to Stefan, who's going to give us his view on what happened over the last two years. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to UK and Changing Europe, in particular on a day like this, to put me in the retrospective panel. I uh, quite enjoy that. Because uh, in any case, what happens next is, is for the UK to sketch out as the political process unfolds within the context of the somewhat extra breathing space that the European Council decided on last week, either an approval of the withdrawal agreement with an extension till May 22nd, or alternatively, an extension of membership till April 12th, by which time the UK would then have to indicate a plan for, for the way forward. But anyway, that's today's context, and it's, it, it's a bit too early perhaps to start looking back at everything that has happened, but. Two years ago, the notification came, so here we are. And I, I wanted, by way of introduction, put a few points on the table to try and explain what has informed the EU's position, what has guided the EU's position during these negotiations, what has informed the conduct of how the EU has managed basically these extraordinary negotiations. But before coming to that, I think it's, it is good in the current climate also to take just a step back and see what we have achieved in these negotiations. Because when we started in June 17, I don't think it was a given that we would be able to conclude an agreement with the UK government on the terms of the withdrawal. There was a lot of uncertainty over that when we started this process in, in, in these extraordinary negotiations. And we had expected to live through 
a couple of very difficult moments, and we did live through a couple of very difficult moments throughout these negotiations. But we have always managed with the UK government to find a constructive, constructive way forward. In spite of our initial take, of course, on this, because if you take a step back again for, from the EU's perspective, as we said many times, Brexit is a lose-lose proposition. So we are in a context where we have to mitigate losses. Now, some people who are advocates of Brexit may want to disagree with that, but from our EU perspective, that is clear that there is an economic and political cost for doing Brexit for both sides, for the UK and, and for the EU. I think that has also to be appreciated if we are to look back now on the negotiations and how they have unfolded, even though the story hasn't finished, is once you accept that you're not in a negotiation where you try to create value together, which is the classic way of you do negotiation with a counterparty to say, well, if, if we agree to this, you agree to that, can we agree to that, can we find a convergence of interest so that we both go home happier in a way? <laughs> And I don't think we would ever have claimed that we could go home happier from, from the Brexit negotiations. And that is important to understand that then also for the peculiar nature of the negotiations, because this was not a commercial bargaining type of negotiations. And this was a negotiations where the EU was confronted with a member leaving at a particular time in its history, and I'll come back to that. And how do we manage that in terms of disentangling it? Not in terms of a give and take kind of negotiations, if I may, may, may say so, but in terms of what is it that the UK exactly wants for its future relationship? How can we disentangle the UK? And I think it, it is important to realize that these negotiations were extraordinary, as we have said from the start, given the, the logic that I, that I just tried to explain. In spite of that, of course, we managed to find a withdrawal agreement, agreed by the UK government on the 14th of November, where I think we both did our best efforts and we both compromised in terms of what are the terms of the withdrawal, in particular on the backstop solution, we both compromised. And it remains the best compromise possible, clearly, where, where, where we are today. And it was endorsed and approved by 27 governments on the other side. And that is also an important achievement on, for the EU negotiation team, obviously, that we have delivered something that the 27 countries say they are happy with in terms of the, or the orderly withdrawal for Brexit. And beyond that, of course, we have the political declaration, which gives a basis to build a new security and economic partnership. And that process could start very soon, in case the withdrawal agreement uh, would be ratified. Um, check the time. If I take a step back, we, the most important document from the start of these negotiations were the April 2017 guidelines of the European Council which was then translated into a negotiation mandate for the first phase of the negotiations. And it is a strategic choice that the EU leaders have made to settle on these guidelines. And it happened, of course, in the extraordinary context of a member state saying we're leaving, but also in a context where geopolitically, globally, there's volatility. Trump was elected four months after the Brexit vote. There were increasing concerns well about the multilateral rules-based order, the global trade order, and the EU itself came out of a rather painful series of episodes in terms of divisions between the EU countries on the Eurozone and on migration. Now, irrespective of the historical context, I think the guidelines would more or less have looked the same, but I think it's important to be mindful of that historical context at that time. And the guidelines of the European Council basically then said, well, with, given that one of the 28 is leaving. Where do we stand? Well, we need to reaffirm our basic foundational principles, which is we are autonomous for our decision making, and we're not going to share the autonomy of decision making with a country that is departing. We need to maintain the integrity of the single market, which is the deepest free trade zone you can find anywhere in the world between independent countries, because it has common rules, common institutions, a capacity also to make rules and react to crises like we did to the financial crisis, where the EU then said we have more single rules, more harmonized rules within a common institutional framework. We need to preserve and protect those achievements. We rediscovered the customs union, if I'm honest, in the commission, talking to a colleague the other day who works in the customs union department. <coughs> well, five years ago, they were, had less visitors than today, I would think, on the customs union. People suddenly <laughs> took a huge interest in what is the customs union, how does it work? 
our common trade policy, our various other common policies. And so the EU needs reform, but it will do so at 27. And so the key strategic choice was we will not do that in the context of Brexit. We need to maintain our autonomy, keep control on the EU side in this process. And that has also informed, I think, the negotiations uh, in a fundamental way. And I say it's a strategic choice because sometimes the EU has been accused of lack of imagination or intransigence from people on the British side, in the British media. But I think it's a strategic choice in the context of the future of the European Union, the protection of its interests, and the preservation of its, fundamental, of its fundamental principles. The other point I, well, and just to, before jumping to another point, of course, is that does not mean, not, I don't mean to say with this that the EU, in protecting its essentials, becomes an inward looking organization. Clearly, we need to have a very productive strategic partnership with the UK. And I think that is the key goal of this whole process. And there's a lot of talk about the terms of the withdrawal, but the, we, keep the, we must keep our eye on the ball that in the end, what we need to do is the orderly withdrawal of the UK in view of creating the conditions and the confidence between the UK and the EU to conclude a new strategic partnership, a close partnership, a close relationship in terms of economic security cooperation and other areas of, of cooperation, which is what the political declaration allows to construct. And that also is, and so that's, I think we need to be mindful that that is the end goal of, of, of the process we are now retrospectively looking at. Another important structuring point was the sequencing of these negotiations, which is also what the European leader, leaders decided. Sequencing meaning first we need sufficient progress on the money, on Ireland, and on citizens' rights before we move to a discussion on the future relationship. And that led, it would benefit of hindsight, relatively quickly to sufficient progress, even though we, on the negotiation side, on both sides, had wanted to go more quicker. Uh, in December 17, we settled on, that yes, there is sufficient progress on these three issues, which means that in the scope of early July 17, early December 17, we managed to define the basic parameters of these three key issues. And the reason why we made such rapid progress is we decided together with the UK from the start to use union law as a basis to manage the disentanglement of the UK. And looking at today's debate and what some MPs or other people in the public debate often say, I think that is not always rightly understood what the withdrawal agreement exactly does. Mm -hmm. It uses concepts of union law post withdrawal to disentangle the UK from the European Union through a carefully managed process and to manage the disruption that Brexit inevitably creates. So it is about a disentanglement. It is not about carrying forward union law post withdrawal because Britain takes back control. That's, that's, that point is clearly taken. And so the use of union law is just is a device, if you wish to, to put it like that, to disentangle the UK in an orderly manner from 45 years of, of economic integration. I think that is also an important point. Two, two more points, if I may, very quickly. Oh. Or, well, no. the next phase, maybe we can leave that for the discussion on the political declaration and the nature of the declaration. Let me then just conclude perhaps with one point, and I'll come back to the declaration, if you wish, during, during the discussion. Is that the no deal today, and I'm sorry to end on a pessimistic note, <laughs> is a likely scenario. And I, again, Listening to what a number of MPs are saying in public broadcasts or in interviews, it is really a likely scenario. <laughs> we are now in a situation where we, we have the, the bifurcation in the road that I sketched that the European Council has said. We'll see what happens in the House of Commons today, in what scenario we are. But we need to start to conclude this, we need to conclude this process now in a way that avoids the no deal. And if the process does not conclude, the no deal remains a default scenario. So no matter how many times people say or even indicatively vote to say, well, we don't want no deal, at some point the process will need to conclude with a yes to the way forward on how the orderly withdrawal will work and how we will then start the negotiations on the future relationship once the UK has withdrawn from the EU.
Thanks very much for getting us started. Let me turn to Peter now. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so much you could go at in this, but I think the absolute kernel of the negotiation was that triangle, which I suspect we've all seen, the, 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 the trilemma of the Irish backstop. Go right back to uh, uh, Mrs May's speech after she became leader to the Tory party conference. She wasn't going to accept the jurisdiction of the ECJ. Uh, uh, she set more red lines about leaving the customs union and leaving the single market. And so she set up that trilemma. Do you wish to have a border in the... Would, first of all, do you wish to have an invisible border in Northern Ireland to protect the Good Friday? Yes, I do. Do you wish to have uh, the right to set your independent trade policy uh, uh, after Brexit? Yes, I do. Do you wish to have no impediment to the internal market of the UK, no border in the Irish Sea? Yes, I do. Well, unfortunately, only two of those things can be true at any one moment. And that was the fundamental frame of the negotiation. Now, people will say, oh, she shouldn't have triggered Article 50. I think a lot of the retrospective stuff is unrealistic. She didn't have a lot of choice. These guys were sitting there saying no negotiation without notification. She was a Remainer prime minister who was under, under great pressure to get on with it. Um, you know, a lot of the retrospective stuff is unrealistic. But I do think there was a moment when the course could have been changed. So she triggers the Article 50. We go through uh, some quite messy stuff about the citizens' rights and the, uh, the bill, but it's essentially that's handbag stuff, right? It's all good theatre for people like me and Jennifer reporting it in Brussels, but it's basically handbag stuff. Um, and we get to November 2017. And out comes a one-page talking point document from the European Commission, um, and the last paragraph of it says, having done all the scoping about how this border is going to work, it seems, Stefan no doubt can quote it verbatim, but it seems inevitable, it seems uh, 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 sensible that Northern Ireland will have to remain aligned to the single market and the customs union insofar as necessary to uh, produce an invisible border, right? The famous bullet point. And... Um, Simon Case, who was then our chief Irish negotiator, uh, was um, delivered this document and literally went white. And um, was incredibly, was immediately worried whether that was going to be enough for sufficient progress. Are you now saying that Northern Ireland has to remain a regulatory exclave of the European Union? Are you essentially appropriating a bit of the United Kingdom in the name of Brexit? And there was a massive to-do. Uh, Jennifer and I were reporting on it. Uh, and then after that, uh, um, there was a meeting at which the EU essentially stepped back. And, and it'd be interesting to hear Stefan's account of this. But the EU stepped back. And out of that meeting, where the Brits said, you know, are you saying we have to give up Northern Ireland in order to get sufficient progress? No. So out of that meeting came the concept of alternative arrangements. So... We are basically saying that, unless you can think of another way around it, if unless, you, unless the trade deal obviates the need to do that. So that begged the question, well, what would that trade deal be? Bearing in mind the triangle, bearing in mind the red lines. And the answer to the question was basically a customs union. We're not going to call it that, but basically a customs union. And then alignment, for the, alignment in, so far as necessary to deliver the border. And... There then ensued a long discussion, but that essentially opened the window into which all of the current mess was created. And it carried on rolling forward with nobody actually ever putting their foot down and saying, you need to make a decision on that triangle. So we had checkers, which still had that dual tariff customs arrangement nonsense, which they were repeatedly told was nonsense. We had MaxVac unicorns, even though there is no border in the world that is invisible delivered by technology. The House of Lords' own, the, the, the Parliament's own cross-party Brexit committee, learned uh, academics were constantly writing. Everybody could see what the problem was, and everybody pretended that it wasn't there or that we could massage it through by pretending that unicorns exist or there could be other arrangements. So you then ask the question, well, who is responsible for not confronting that question? Did the EU not do enough to put its foot down? 
Because after the joint report, there was the joint report was a, was a absurd concatenation of contradictions. Paragraphs 49 and 50, uh, 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 you know, really made no sense. And although, and the protocol that initially came out of that was a very one-eyed reading of paragraph 49. Um, not the way Stefan, I'm sure, would present it, but a very one-eyed reading of 49. And to be fair to the EU, over time, they agreed to the all-UK custom component that Mrs May suggested in her June 7 customs paper. But still, the central fallacy that this triangle could be solved was never resolved, to the point where six months ago we were saying, well, how many absolutely die-hard, Bakerite, crazy, die-in-a-ditch ERG types are there? And we would say, well, it's 10, it's 20, something. Well, no, it's probably only five or six, but it really comes down to it. By the time the meaningful vote came along, her having got the all-UK customs arrangement, she lost 118 Tories. That, that rump metastasized. So the question is, why did it metastasize? Was there a moment, and I mean, Faisal will know better than me, was there a moment after the election, was there a moment when that debate was really firing, which would be in January 2018, David Liddington gave an interview to my paper in which he said, well, we could have a customs union. It would be better than the Turkey customs union. We need to consider this. And Mrs May was backed into a corner and said, we're not going to be in A or the customs union, even as she quietly carried on a negotiation which essentially delivered that to all intents and purposes. Was there a moment when Mrs May, rather than constantly trying to triangulate, constantly trying to buy off one side and the other, as, as Asa Bennett was saying, could have stood up to people, either because she was made to by the EU, which is now being very tough, or by her own reckoning, saying to, maybe after the election, saying to MPs, look, the alternative is that man over there, right? That Trotskyite over there. You know, she was never as weak, I think, and this is perhaps, you know, a question for Pfizer, but she was never as weak as she thought she was. When she falls, the gates of hell opened as the party ripped itself to pieces. But she allowed, and you go forward to the Malthouse Compromise, you go, she allowed them constantly to set the bar in places that she knew to be undeliverable. And so I think that, you know, if you ask where Brexit went wrong, it was collectively, she didn't force the issue and nor did the EU, and the result is the mess that we're in now. Thank you very much, Peter, for that. And now over to you, Sarah. Where, where did Brexit go wrong for you? So um, I think that it's been a process. It's been a long process. There have been a number of points where things could have turned quite, uh, out quite differently, and we've already heard a few of them. But I'd like to just go back to a couple of the points that Stefan uh, raised, because from the EU side, which we really do not hear very much about, in the UK debate, I mean, um, in the previous discussions of like, where are we going now? When will we see the results of the indicative votes? Where's that taking us? Which extension period are we really looking at? There's never the consideration of, well, what is the response from the EU? And so I, I'd like to just uh, say a few broader points about um, where the EU is at the moment granted the process that it has had to go through and the choices it has had to make and therefore why it understandably is very cautious and rather pessimistic in um, what comes next. Because I think that um, for the EU, um, this has been uh, very organized and very um, well handled uh, process from the very beginning. There were a lot of resources and efforts, so it's not because it's been easy. There's been a lot of effort put, uh, put into coordinating between the EU 27, uh, and it has been very successful, but also a difficult uh, process. There, it's a, 27, a union of 27 very diverse countries with different interests at stake here, um, in the Brexit negotiations, but certainly also with a whole lot of other things going on. Um, as Stefan mentioned, um, uh, there was the, the Trump administration, but also within Europe we had a number of important changes in government um, during these past few years. Macron has come in, we've had elections in the Netherlands, and Europe is changing. Um, We've already seen the, the, the concerns that come out in national, local elections 
during this Brexit um, uh, uh, process, but there's more to come. Spain is going to have elections. There are a whole battery of, of countries that are now looking at um, local and national elections in their home countries, and Brexit is an issue that needs to be contained. Up until now, it has been clear that there are economic and political um, losses from leaving the EU. And that kind of message on the EU side is what carries through to their domestic politics. But that's not necessarily a message that will continue if the process does, is not contained and continues to be handled in a unified matter, manner from, from, from the EU 27. So this is one of the reasons why we should not expect uh, any great favours from the EU side up until now. Uh, sorry, uh, for what comes next. But up until now, I think that there's been a disappointment on the EU side um, with the process. Um, first of all, because the UK leaving is not just any member state leaving. It is with a great loss for the EU in terms of the economy, politically on the uh, world stage, um, but also because exactly of the domestic problems that many of the governments are facing with illiberal politics, um, uh, Euroscepticism, etc., the UK has of course been a very vocal member state uh, and would have been leading perhaps in some of the very important decisions that are on the table after European elections, after a new commission comes in. So there's great regret. Let's not have any doubt about that. There is a re great regret for the UK to leave um, the EU. And many um, governments at the time of the referendum, they um, voiced uh, this open regret, but also had an expectation that a compromise would be found that is certainly not um, like what we see in Theresa May's uh, withdrawal agreement. I have only heard from ministers and representatives, ambassadors, uh, a surprise with the fact that there was, by now, a complete rejection from the UK government of single market membership, of a customs union even, and other arrangements that they had thought would bridge some of these very, very substantial um, disruptions that uh, may come about. Also, there um, has been disappointment that it has gotten to this point where we are between a withdrawal agreement that all 27 member states have been able to agree to, but which they find to be at a um, lower level of cooperation that they had hoped for, and then the fact that the no deal scenario is a real, um, uh, realistic um, scenario by this time. In fact, I think that in the UK debate, it's very interesting to see uh, how the no deal scenario um, almost appear as if the fact that the, UK, uh, that the Parliament has decided that it's off the table means that it's off the table on the EU side. It is um, expected, I think, that we are now looking at a no-deal scenario, but that governments are hoping to be proven wrong. I think that there have been so many uh, points during this process where they had um, assumed different outcomes from the UK side than what we have witnessed. So, for example, let's not forget that it was the UK who insisted on a very close link between the political declaration and the withdrawal agreement, more so than uh, the EU side um, uh, did. And now we are looking at the separation of the two with, of course, a lot of uncertainty linked to, well, if this political declaration doesn't go through the House of Commons, what is it really we are looking at in the next phase of negotiations? So I think I'll stop here, but my main message is that um, uh, the EU will... I only hear that this, uh, this great regret and a great worry at this point in time and that the process has been difficult, but certainly uh, it will be no less challenging uh, going forward. 
and I think that the UK will be welcomed in any shape or form uh, that it wants to pursue its um, uh, further collaboration with the EU. But we should uh, be under no illusion that the main priorities, as Stefan also pointed out, will be for the challenges that the EU itself is facing to stay united and to find solutions to those policy challenges rather than necessarily um, uh, give away anything to the UK. Thank you. And now over to Faisal, your take on the last two years, please. Yeah, OK. I'm, I'm going to sort of uh, zoom out a little bit because I think it's necessary to put it in geopolitical st strategic context, which I think is really important and often missed. Um, <clears throat> but I will go into some just basic gossip of what it's like to interview Theresa May in this context <laughs> in about five minutes. Um, but I think at the out, as we stand, it's important to be clear about this, and Stefan was gave us a news line there, uh, that we, he may regret doing that, but um, uh, it, as, as we stand, these negotiations are, the, are on the point of failure, and because of a strategic mutual misperception, the misperception on the UK side that the EU will value its trade surplus with the UK more than it values the integrity of its own structures. And that has, is a sort of continuation of the referendum mantras, which are understandable. You, you make your points, convincing points, but then really should have been junked by the government as a perception of what the EU is doing. But the EU's perception that the UK, it, let me put this very carefully, it has the functioning institutions of a normal liberal democracy, <laughs> which I'm not sure, frankly, and I say this as a political editor who's observed this stuff close up, what I'm talking about here is the feedback mechanisms where bad ideas or stuff that is just not true gets kind of dissolved away by the media, by politicians. It is not happening. So those are two fundamental misperceptions which I think you can map out in detail, lead us to where we are today. Um, let me do the zoom out first. And if you think about a negotiation, this is about the triggering of Article 50. And in, an, in a negotiation, let me give you some qualities I've just written down that I think help make a negotiation successful. Credibility, authority, trust, stability, clarity, unity, right? I'll leave that to you. Um, but what you do need is you also need as many of the academics here will know, this is probably an audience where I don't even need to spell out the acronym, uh, acronym you need a BATNA, you need a best alternative to a negotiated uh, agreement, uh, which, is, which I said was game theory, but this is shows you something about my Twitter following. It's not game theory, it's negotiation theory. Okay, it's a joke for about three people there. Um, um, but here's the crucial thing, you need a credible BATNA. If, you're, if you just shout, no deal's better than a bad deal. No deal's better than a bad deal. By the way, no deal is better than a bad deal. That is not credible unless it's underpinned fully. And I don't just mean by building customs posts and hiring ferries, right? You've got to have a credible political economy underneath that. And so this is a criticism, if you like, aimed both at the government for perhaps not preparing for no deal quickly enough, but it's also criticism aimed at Brexiters for, you know, do we really think that no deal has a sustainable political economy backing in the UK? You know, do we, do we think that that as a concept is what a sustainable majority of UK voters, with all the consequences, but the opportunities, balancing off, don't even have to predict that it'll be a disaster. You just have to say there'll be winners and there'll be losers. Will the, win, will the losers from that process be louder than the potential winners from a US trade deal? What is the point of parliament if it is not to mediate between those types of decisions? Has that decision been prefigured by the referendum? All these are reasonable questions. Instead, what we've got is, yes, it's all been decided, and if you don't agree with us, you're a traitor, right? That, how can you make decisions in a liberal democracy that are hugely consequential for decades to come based on shut up, you're a traitor, which has basically been one of the main lines of our political discourse over the past couple of years. And just to great irony, you know, just ahead of the Article 50 triggering, 
you know, things, you know, things like the, uh, the Supreme Court case. Actually, Brexit ministers tell me that having a statutory underpinning to the triggering of Article 50 was incredibly helpful to them. They think that there would have been a judicial review that would have put back the Brexit process years had they not done that, and yet Jeannie Miller gets death threats. Likewise, the meaningful vote process. Wow. Now being deployed by the hard Brexiters against the Brexit deal, and yet at the time it was mutineers and saboteurs and all that sort of stuff. So um, I think... You know, you do need to wind back, I think, and think about people are now today fond of blaming Parliament. Parliament was elected a year after the referendum, yes, on some promises, but Labour had it in their manifesto that no deal wasn't an option. Okay, it was in there, and they had a 40% vote share. Actually, that 85% number on 85% will respect the referendum, you know, the PM then understandably made the claim that that was an 85%, I mean, it's a curious claim, that those people that voted against her entirely back her Brexit strategy. I mean, she claimed her own vote and the vote for the opposition as vindication for her Brexit strategy. Actually, I genuinely believe the PM had an amazing opportunity that potentially a different Prime Minister would have grasped the moment after losing her majority to press uh, a reset button and there are, there are, there are um, important precedents for this. Look at how Canada managed a much smaller, simpler negotiation, renegotiation of NAFTA. They formed something called the NAFTA Council. They involved the opposition. They involved the union movement, businesses, small businesses, tech, universities. And they came up with, I don't know what it was, five, ten pages of strategy for something that, although not everybody liked it, probably people hated bits of it, that was credible, unifying, you know, there was a position there. And the end result is, those on the other side of the table think they've got someone to negotiate with, with a mandate that is durable and sustainable. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it sort of had to come to where we've got at the moment... Um, it, you know, let's see where that goes. Let me give you a couple of examples of the, this sort of misperception. It's amazing in a way. So I'm interviewing the Prime Minister a month after the triggering of Article 50, on a trip to the Middle East, on atop a hotel in Jordan. I have a certain sort of, I try to be polite in the sense that I try to bend the question into wherever we are, and not just ask a series of random questions. Okay, Jordan, as you know, Prime Minister, Jordan has a trade deal with the EU. Uh, is it going to continue? And, and then, then you open up a whole conversation about, at that point, the claim, and we forget this, the claim of the UK government two years ago was that by this point, not only would we have signed a divorce deal, but we would already have a trade deal signed. Now, they knew that that was not true. Okay, so I'm a political editor. I'm asking the Prime Minister... Come on. I mean, why are you telling people this? Why are you telling people something that you know is not true? That, and she says, well, it took four questions. By the fourth question, she says, I suppose technically there is, a, you know, the EU can't actually sign the deal until the day after we leave. So that was one example. That's the example that um, Pete refers to, and this was an amazing one. We were in China, and we knew that there was talk about a customs union that, uh, that had arisen as a result of the backstop. And these talks about, not only talks, they had literally legislated, defended by a minister in a public bill committee, the idea of giving fast track authority to form a customs union with the EU. That was in UK legislation. It was being planned, or the option was being prepared. Ask the Prime Minister, why are you preparing the, uh, for a customs union with the EU? Oh, uh, no, we're not, we're not, we're leaving the customs union. No, promise that, why are you praying a customs union with the EU? We're leaving the customs union. It's in our manifesto. It's just not answering the question. And that is what caused, then, uh, the headlines of she won't rule out a customs union, and then she ruled it out, and then Liam Fox said that he would, and then he ruled it out in a Bloomberg interview. And then by Sunday, and then we were waiting for 48 hours, and by Sunday night, Number 10 issued a, a directive saying, no the customs union, no our customs union. It's an amazing way to do business. If I roll back in terms of the geopolitics of this, I think the other thing that is missed is that there's a third party in these divorce talks which hugely impacted the EU's ability to be flexible. And this is not recognised 
on the British side, which is the United States of America. And maybe Stefan will disagree with me, but I think the presence of Trump changed the possibilities of a US trade deal, increased them greatly. Equally, the US president has said many hostile things about the European Union as a structure. So if we, in trying to get a decent divorce deal out of the EU, are actively flirting, as it were, with the US, that is going to change the perception of how flexible they will be on our sort of single market regulations, are we there or are we not, or can we carry on having frictionless trade even though we're sort of a little bit out of the structures. I think there may have been something you possibly could have done there. The minute we are going to start taking merging with US regulations or thinking about that, that is totally off the table. And I, I can't believe that, that our government did not realise that that was the inevitable consequence. I mean, that's just with, with a sort of relatively normal US administration, but with uh, the, the Trump administration, whose key advisers are actively hostile to the European Union, totally changes the game. So you're facing a negotiation partner where you're thinking about they're trying to protect their trade surplus, but they're actually trying to protect themselves as an entity. I think that changes the, the, uh, the, the game a little. So I think there are structural reasons where we are, where, uh, where we appear. There's a strategic misperception. Um, I think our best alternative to a negotiated agreement was not credible, uh, both because we didn't invest in it, but also because... The other side of the equation has to believe, has to believe what you believe. They have to believe that it's going to be uh, really bad for them. They just don't. They believe we don't believe in experts anymore, as Michael Gove famously told me. They still do. So we can tell them they're going to do really badly, much worse than us. If they don't believe it, it's a pointless play. So I just wrote, I, I mean, I pondered this a lot, and I'll leave you with this. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. I ponder, when you put that all into the mix, whether uh, a totally different negotiation strategy would have achieved a lot more, which would be perhaps to have, to have prepared for no deal on the side, but wrapped everything in far more cooperative language uh, in trying to get the best possible concessions out of the EU, have announced at the outset unilaterally guaranteeing citizens' rights, for example, and had a serious talk, even though some uh, understandably against it, uh, single market and customs union, uh, and that would have led us to a better place. I, I question that, but that's up for debate. Thank, thank you very much, Faisal, and, and all the panellists for very incisive contributions. Before uh, handing over to the floor, I, I want to put a few questions to our panellists myself. And, and firstly, Stefan, to you. I mean, we, we've heard from Faisal explain very eloquently the... Uh, the, 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 the misperceptions or the, the, the refusal of the British government often to, to face up to the true choices and to be honest with the British public. So we know there's a lot of fault on the British side. But nonetheless, do you think, was it, was it a mistake on the EU side to, to be so strict on this sequencing? Do you think we could have ended up in a better place today if the EU had been willing to consider the divorce and the free, free trade and the future at the same time? And it, it's not just a point that uh, the British like to make. I mean, some... Some uh, on the e you hear influential EU voices, not necessarily within the EU structures, but say uh, I saw Clemens first of the IFO this week, for example, saying we should extend uh, negotiations for two years and we should consider both the future and the divorce at the same time. So, I mean, do you think there's anything that EU could have done differently to avoid it, the situation we're in today? Well, it's an interesting question because Peter basically said we we should have been stricter on the first phase at some point because you should have put your foot down. <laughs> so uh, if I take a step back from all the process that, that also panel, fellow panelists put on the table, and you look at the substance of what is on the table, I'm not sure if an entirely different process would have led to a radically different outcome in terms of something that was said earlier. We would have put the citizens, and it was a decision both by the UK and the EU, in the withdrawal agreement. The situation of the financial obligations of the UK is known. So that was an essential part of the withdrawal agreement. 
no matter how the process would have unfolded. And the Irish question was there, avoiding the hard border, the Good Friday Agreement, the single market integrity, all these things would have had to find a solution. Now, it was the UK government which asked for a single customs territory at the end, post-sequencing, if I, and I come back to your question. So it could have somewhat been different, but the solution would have, in essence, achieved the same objective of avoiding a hard border in Northern Ireland, either closer to what we initially proposed, uh, or then with the single customs territory that, that the UK proposed. I don't think the sequencing was a mistake. Uh, from the 27, it was in the guidelines as soon in April, it was clear earlier than April 17 that the sequencing was an important point. It was a legal point, obviously. And it brings us a bit to the discussion that, to hook it a bit up to what, what fellow panelists said. We could have had a clearer political declaration compared to what we have now. And at some point, some EU leaders put that on the table as, you know, it, it would do more clarity, the better. But the negotiations went on the future relationship, post-sequencing, post-phase one as they went, and ended up with a declaration which defines a number of parameters, but also leaves some options open. And so your question is, should we have started with the future relationship? Even post-sequencing, when we wanted to discuss the future relationship in March, there was no clear request from the UK. Then came checkers, and then came all the post-checkers, uh, leading up to the eventual declaration that we agreed in November. And I hear Peter when he said, well, maybe should the EU have put its foot down, but I think what we have put our foot down when we felt that in these negotiations the integrity of the single market was under threat, or the correct functioning of the institutions and the autonomy of the EU decision-making was under threat. But on the other issue, like, does the UK want a customs union or not? Does the UK want a different model from the free trade area that we have put in the political declaration? That is not something the EU could decide. So there is a responsibility for the UK to basically finally now say, well, yes, we want Brexit, and this is the kind of future relationship we want. And from the EU side, we've left the options open, so to say. I mean, the single customs there, that's my final word, on, in the backstop, is not a future relationship. It is a starting point to discuss a future relationship. But it is not a future relationship. So that still needs to be negotiated once the UK will have left. It leaves options open, that's my point, basically, mm. subject to respect for the EU's fundamental mm. principles. And I wanted to pick up one of your, your other points as well. Um, I, of course, we're here today to talk about the, the, the past, but you, you said now we're, that no deal really is a likely scenario. Would you be able to sketch out for us what happens if there is no deal? Because there are many people, not in this room, I'm sure, but maybe 100 metres from here, who imagine that if there's a no deal, then we'll be sitting down to negotiate um, a trade agreement on the April the 13th. Could, could you sketch out what, how the EU will respond in a no-deal scenario? By protecting unilaterally its interests. So by taking temporary measures, and a number have, are clear, and, and actually all of them are clear which one they are. Two have not been adopted yet by the legislative machine in Brussels, so to say, but on aviation, on trucking, on uh, a wide range of other issues. We have, adopted on that, we have adopted legislation that makes clear what will happen in the case of no deal. And we have also since, I think we started in December 17, informed stakeholders, business citizens as well, in terms of what they had to do in case of no deal scenario to be prepared. We have just done in the commission a round of bilateral talks in each of the capitals to assess the state of play, to assess preparedness. Member states are prepared. That doesn't mean there won't be disruption on the EU27 side. It won't be smooth. But let's be clear about that. But it is manageable, we think, on our side in terms of the preparatory measures that we have taken, so which are measures of a nature of informing businesses, stakeholders, what they have to do in terms of shifting things from the UK to the single market in case they operate under single market licensing regimes and all the rest of it. In terms of what happens at the border, we will apply most favored nation tariffs at the border in case of no deal. 
because that is part of the global reputation as the EU as well in terms of the global rules-based order for trade that I referred to, is the UK will become a third country without a preferential trade deal and therefore falls under the basic WTO regime. Um, we have a number of other measures that we are putting in place on the budget and on fisheries and, and, and those kind of issues, legislative measures. Um, and, and how do and, we but there won't be any negotiation with the UK. How do, how, but how do we pick up the pieces? If there's no negotiation with the UK, do, do, you, do you then bring the w elements of the withdrawal agreement back? I, I think we have to avoid that we have to pick up pieces. I mean, we have a fully fledged piece there, which is the withdrawal agreement. And so the best scenario is clearly that that is ratified in the UK. It refers to the political declaration. The political declaration scopes the future and defines parameters for the future. The negotiations on the future, of course, will then start afterwards. That is a much more preferable scenario than having to pick up pieces. Okay, maybe, maybe more for, for questions, but let me, let me just briefly actually turn to, to Sarah, because I wanted to, to ask you particularly why, why the quality of our debate on Brexit has been so poor. And I noticed that in, in the Danish parliament, uh, they've had for a very long time, they have a system where MPs give, uh, give ministers a mandate when they're negotiating in the EU. Do you think there's something now that, that Westminster could learn from, from Denmark as we, as we go forward or from other EU countries? I think that's a, that's a really interesting uh, development. That, um, so it's not just in Denmark, but now it's actually 14 member states that have a system where parliaments are um, very involved in EU policy making through their committees and um, also, so it's formal scrutiny, it's formal participation, and in some cases even giving mandates to negotiators when they go to Brussels. <laughs> But I think that um, that's not the only thing to it. That's more, let's say, an internal parliamentary and party political dynamic. But I think certainly there's also something going on, of course, in the more public debate. And one thing I, I thought to pick up on that you mentioned before, Faisal, about you know, the way the debate has happened in the UK has been about, you know, um, I think you said that um, the other side has to believe that it will be heard in these negotiations in order to, to give in. But um, it is clear from the EU side that um, they will be heard, the UK will be heard. As, as Stefan pointed out, it, this is a lose-lose situation. But from the EU side, there is no, no um, desire to talking about you know, hurting the other side. It's about finding solutions in a situation that is extremely challenging and which comes with real economic, political, but also social costs and, and you know, uh, UK, uh, EU citizens' rights. I'm one of them if, if we're having to, to think about you know, our status in, in the UK. Those are, those are real uh, issues that the, that the EU uh, has um, as its key priorities. And if it comes to a no deal uh, scenario, um, you know, there is a lot of preparation that has gone into to it on the EU side, but it is still with a huge um, uncertainty about the legal consequences uh, and, um, of course, economic co consequences. But I think that, you know, this whole legal uh, vacuum that ensues after and if it was to be a no deal scenario, that's the, that's the real concern. Come back to our other panelists in, in the question and answer because I see there are lots <coughs> of hands. And the gentleman over in the middle with the sunglasses, I think I saw you first. So could you introduce yourself and where you're from, please? Yeah, um, my name's Miller. I'm a, a lawyer for my sins. Uh, I've got two very brief questions uh, for Professor Derink. Um, the first is uh, whether the uh, negotiating team. Uh, obtained any legal guidance on the p limitations and parameters uh, circumscribing their scope for negotiation? And if so, might that be published? And the second question um, relates to a quote that appeared in Le Point International, a French newspaper, which was attributed to Monsieur Barnier. Uh, I don't know if it's a true and accurate quote, but the English translation is, uh, I'll have done my job if, in the end, the deal is so tough on the British that they'd prefer to stay in the EU. 
Um, and from a, an EU law point of view, it strikes me that if that was driving any of the negotiating strategy, then we need to have an alternative to the withdrawal treaty because there are about 400 million people in the EU who could apply for judicial review and have it annulled. Thank you. We'll take a, a few more. There was someone also on that row. Uh, yes, just further on the, on the same row, please. Yes, um, I'm sorry, my name's Adrian Brossiter. I used to work for the government on EU issues. Um, my question again uh, is uh, to Mr. Dorink. Um, you've quite rightly talked about the three fundamental principles, anchoring uh, decision-making, uh, uh, autonomous decision-making, sorry, um, so no impact from the external party on EU uh, internal workings. The, inter uh, the sacrosanct nature of the internal market and the customs union. Did you explain these things very clearly to Jeremy Corbyn when he came to Brussels two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we'll take one more at the, at the front here. The, the gentleman with the pen, yes, nearest the microphone. P Peter Wilson-Smith from Meritus. What does the panel think of the fact that the political declaration concentrates almost exclusively on manufacturing and largely ignores the services industry, which is the major part of the economy. I mean, it's, it's quite odd that there are, there are more paragraphs on the fishing industry, which employs 12,000 people, than on financial services, which is a rather important industry. And I mean, I'm, I'm told that the EU was uh, surprised that the British government didn't make more of this. How, how did we get to this position? And we'll just take one more from the lady at the front with, in the black jacket. Hello, my name is Baiba Braj. I'm Latvian ambassador here in London. And my question actually is to our British friends and gurus here. Uh, do you think throughout these two years, this process of discussion and internal negotiation and a sort of exposure to the realities of relationship within the EU has brought more knowledge and understanding of the ties that we have, actually, de facto, just as Faisal was saying, that there are the existing treaties, the existing sort of ties that benefit both sides. And, you know, reflecting uh, my experience in Brussels, you know, I remember that it was the British side who wanted the digital single market and pushed it during our EU presidency. It was the British side. Uh, who created very much the idea of the external trade policy, common external trade policy, and further back, the single market. Do you think these two years have brought something that can be tangibly used for further negotiations or relationship building? Thank you. Stefan, can we start with you, um, and yes. particularly the questions addressed to you on the legal guidance first? Yes, um, I'm not sure if I understood that question, so I'll, if you want to ask it again, but I, I'm not sure what legal guidance you're speaking of. On the, the article in Le Point, which I remember very well, uh, because I was with Michel Barnier, he, it quotes an anonymous friend, I believe, and it has been retweeted quite a significant number of MPs as well. He basically told me, I've never said that, and I don't believe this. It's not what I think, I mean, it's not my... And I think your question is rooted in a very deep misunderstanding on this punishment thesis that the EU somehow was out there to, to punish the UK. In reality, what has happened, and this was part of my introduction, is that the EU from the start said we have some fundamental principles, and we're not going to reform those principles to create a new quasi-single market with the UK if you're leaving our institutions and if you're leaving free movement of people and all, and all the rest of it. So, that offered a choice to the UK in terms of future relationship, but a choice within the limits of, well, each time you need to respect the fundamental principles of, of, of the European Union. I think people underestimate sometimes that it is one of 28 countries leaving, while 27 countries are staying and want to protect and preserve what they are doing, right? So um, the second question on Mr. Corbyn, while we... Uh, what I would say to that is that the political declaration is constructed in a way that allows a closer economic relationship to happen. <coughs> and that we have explained that. The political declaration is a scoping document of a non-binding nature, which sets, basically, which sets us off for the negotiations on the future once the UK will have left. So it doesn't define the end point of these negotiations necessarily, of course. 
It's a scoping exercise that defines where we have a number of parameters we can already define now. And so that's the nature of that document. And I think that has to be understood also in the context of the indicative vote process and what is happening now in the country here. Mm -hmm. And as to the first question, if I understood it was whether the Commission had attained legal guidance that circumscribed the scope of the negotiations, is, is there anything you could, uh, could say to that point? Was there any legal advice from the Commission's in-house legal team on how to, how to conduct the negotiations? Well, there was lots of legal advice, not just from the Commission, from the Council Legal Service, the European Parliament Legal Service made various analyses, but our legal basis is Article 50. So. Mm. Yeah. Peter. Article 50, which says withdrawing, defi sorry, <laughs> define the terms of withdrawing, worth repeating, I think, taking into account the framework for the future relationship. That's what we have delivered with the UK government. Mm. Peter, would you like to, to pick up on maybe the question on the political declaration? You know, why, why does it ignore services, which is the large part of the UK economy? Uh, I think, you know, there was that famous, um, rather good sort of heat map that um, uh, Goodwin and Curtis uh, uh, fellows of this parish did about what were the overriding issues about Brexit. And the big one that comes up is immigration, overwhelmingly. So if you work back from the need to curb free movement, which Mrs May did as a Home Secretary who fostered a hostile environment against immigration as Home Secretary, you know, if that's your benchmark, I mean, we saw David Cameron try and fail to get a carve out on, on free movement. If that's your benchmark, then the, almost the only openly true thing the white paper said was, we're going to take a hit on services, right? And so you then, if you then start to work back from that point and triangulate the issue of the Irish border, you end up taking a hit on services and doing a deal on customs, which is what she's done. I mean, this wretched deal is created purely by gravity, not by strategy, right? <laughs> it is literally hewn out of, you know, it's chip by chip by chip. The trouble is that the process of doing that meant that she lost everybody. I mean, the thing she wanted that they didn't want to give her, the all UK customs arrangement that upset the French and caused all that fuss, she lost by 230 votes because she got it too late and she hadn't done what she needed to do, which was to have a grown-up conversation you know, I mean, it's interesting about Faisal's point about well, after the election, you know, would the Labour Party really have sat down around the table all grown up and nicey-nicey? You know, this is a woman who was clinging on by her fingernails, remember, days away from, you know, the Labour Party saying to the Queen, well, you know, why don't you let Jeremy have a go at forming a government, right? She gets the DUP on board, you know, of all the people to get on board. You know, she's then going to have a big tent negotiation. Well, you know, maybe, right? And, I mean, and then that's absent the fact we're talking Theresa May here, right? You know, it was never going to happen, right? But there was, I think, a moment where she could have not let all of these hairs running. And, and, and my, my kind of point to Stefan was really, I don't want for a second to think, to say that, you know, it's the EU's fault they weren't tougher on us. Tough, tough, tough. But I think their worry about this, you know, fueling this persecution, punishment complex probably allowed them, I mean, if you go, even the political declaration that was done in November that had this big thing about alternative arrangements, I don't know anybody serious in Brussels that thinks that a unicorn's coming clip-clopping into view. So, so, you know, actually, why were we all entertaining this nonsense when actually it didn't work, right? It wasn't that the ERG went, oh, yes, well, now you say we can have a proper fully-fledged unicorn country. you've given us £20 million pounds to go, go hunting. That, that'll be all right. It demonstrably hasn't worked. Thank, thank you. Sarah, could I, could I ask you to pick up on the point on, you know, has this, has the two years, has this two-year process made us more knowledgeable about the ties that we had, have in the, or even have today in the EU? I think that if anything, you know, we have had um, a political debate in the UK th that has no precedence. It's been really unique to see how people have engaged, and one can say from a democracy point of view, that's of course great that we now have um, a large group of people who have not otherwise been engaged in politics uh, for a while and not necessarily uh, engaged in at election time, that certainly they've come out to have opinions, which is also why it is uh, a very contentious uh, decision whether to have a second referendum. I think that that requires a lot of thinking in terms of, you know, are we 
uh, putting this to the people again. I'm not saying one way or the other, but this is something to certainly have at the forefront of discussions um, if, if it was to go ahead. Um, I think I'd like to just um, one point in the questions that were the question that was asked about the political declaration that um, the political declaration um, is as has already been pointed out simply opening up negotiations um, you know, simply setting the grounds for the negotiations coming forward but specifically on the on the example that you said about the fisheries I mean that's one of the examples which really shows that the EU has had to compromise. Because if you ask Danish fishermen, French fishermen, Dutch um, interest in um, uh, fishing waters around the UK, they have really had to accept what, was, um, what they had to give up here, for in, to, even so in the, in the political declaration. So I think that we, we, we need to appreciate that in these negotiations that have been extremely difficult on the EU side as well, there's been a lot of goodwill and there's been a lot of compromises struck already. And, you know, we're starting at a point um, with the withdrawal agreement, if, if it goes through, where that needs to be acknowledged. And Faisal, if I could turn to you just briefly, do you think that has this two-year process made us more knowledgeable about how the EU works? Uh, uh, probably a bit more, but that's probably uh, quite optimistic in terms of it thinking that the consequences will help uh, the debate. Essentially, we haven't decided on the strategy. We haven't decided, it, therefore, on what shape or flavour of Brexit will serve the strategy of the country. And you instead have had the political system... Uh, turning it into a fairly entrenched culture war, which seems difficult to reconcile. But the difficulty, I would say, where well, I feel slightly sorry for the Brussels side of things, is you do have two blocks now in the United Kingdom. Things could flip, don't say they will, quite quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it isn't, there isn't like a spectrum in between. It's like, and you saw that in the votes in Parliament. On the one hand, people defining themselves by their Brexit vote and political parties getting in turn defined by that. And on the other, fairly organised, millions of people now wanting to reverse or wanting another referendum. And it's like, it's kind of quite binary. Mm -hmm. So how do you negotiate with that when those are big, big blocks now? I, you know. I suppose you. we're about to find out. Yeah. We're going to take one more rapid round of questions. There was someone at the back who, uh, who was waiting. But yeah, we'll, we'll go to the gentleman in the, in the very last row. Just on the on the corner. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is particularly for Stefan from the EU point of view. I'm a British and Irish citizen from Northern Ireland, so you can understand that, that is the most pressing concern for me. And you've described how no deal at this point is now more likely. The logical extension of that argument would seem to suggest that the circumstances which everyone wanted to avoid, which is a hard border in Ireland, becomes more likely. What I wonder is, you've mentioned as well that the backstop is really a starting point for negotiations on the future relationship. Why then, especially knowing the likes of the DUP, whose credo has always been never, 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 Ulster <laughs> says no, why was the backstop not talked about as part of the future relationship separately from the withdrawal agreement so that the divorce could happen first and foremost? and then move on to talk about the Irish situation in the context of the future rather than the divorce stage. Okay, thank you. And there were, there were a few more hands. Yes, just in the, in the third row on, the, on this side. Uh, hi, uh, Michael Shaw here. Um, my question is to Stefan about the... We know that um, Downing Street wanted these negotiations in a more private... Uh, secret way rather than as opposed to the EU's transparent uh, nature to, to the approach to the negotiations. Um, but given that we ended up with the negotiating tunnel, do you think that showed that the EU were wrong in that they couldn't have these negotiations in such a transparent scenario? And there was, uh, yes, right at the front, a gentleman in the blue jacket. I'm, I'm Professor Chris Mafidon. I teach and supervise master students on EU and technology. Um, my question is to Stefan as well, because I think you were saying fundamentally the EU hasn't changed. Uh, by the time Brexit happened, we had a very strong 
Francois Hollande, combined with a very strong uh, Angela Merkel, one of the top leaders in Europe. And since the election of Macron, wouldn't you see that the power and the position of the EU in negotiating with the UK has altered radically, uh, and the fact that Theresa May was sent back with specific dates to go do this at this date, go do that at the other date. It sounds like me talking to my student, saying I'm giving you extension to submit your assignment. So it's far more uh, uh, um, uh, uh, significant to a body of independent nation than you might have perceived. Thank you. I would just, just one final question, the man in the, in the third row. Richard Rose, author of Governing Without a Consensus, An Irish Perspective, <laughs> 1971. <laughs> I wonder, further to the young gentleman in the back, uh, how and why Ireland, I know the Irish Akrep people, <laughs> They've been extremely good. Dublin has actually captured Brussels. You could regard this as something that might be treated as subsidiarity, something which... Oh, could you build to your question? Because we're really yes, short I will. of time. Something that could have been handled differently by Northern Ireland, the UK. I wonder... And it's internal Irish politics, Fine Gael, Sinn Féin, Dublin, not Sinn Féin, Belfast. I wonder how much room, if at all, there is for some wiggle by Dublin, because perhaps they've regarded they've gone too far. Okay. Uh, Stefan, quite a few questions for you there. Would you, would you like to, to, to start off? There was, there was another one on the sequencing and, and the backstop. Perhaps you'd yes. like to take that first. Yes, well, I'll take the one with together with the last question on, on where Brexit creates the biggest problem in terms of withdrawal issues is in Ireland, the Northern Ireland at the land border. So when we started this, the joint report of December 17, the various options, the backstop option was in there in terms of a Northern Irish specific treatment, alignment with rules insofar as they are of importance for avoiding a hard border and with the customs element. So that, is a leg that in that sense is a legacy issue from two angles from our perspective and also from the UK's perspective. Protection of the Good Friday Agreement in all the dimensions. Brexit creates a challenge, North-South cooperation, all the rest of it. And the integrity of the single market. So the way it was originally designed was this is a legacy issue, withdrawal issue that needs to be managed through finding an insurance policy and then through giving the UK, as Peter rightly said earlier, in the joint report of December, an opportunity to come up with other specific solutions. Because that was another element of way forward that we designed together with UK at that time, at least conceptually, without going into the operational details, the, the alternative arrangements, basically. At the end of the process, when the UK said, well, we would like to have a UK-wide customs arrangement that became the single customs territory, that then becomes something which is more closely linked to the future relationship. So in that sense, the legal elements of the discussion changed, which is why then in the political declaration you find the sentence, the future relationship will build and improve on the single customs territory. Because, that is, because to justify having that kind of element in the withdrawal treaty from a legal perspective, you had to make the link with the future. But again, clearly the backstop is not a future relationship. The end point of that is not defined in terms of the political declaration. And that, I think, re replies also to the last question, because it's really a mistake to think that this is, an, this is also a European backstop. In our internal discussions, this is about the integrity of the single market, when I mean internal discussions with member states. It's as much about the protection of the Good Friday Agreement, for which there is solidarity from the 27, but it's also on the protection of the single market. When I speak to businesses in France or in the Netherlands or other countries or Denmark, the backstop comes up also from the perspective of how will the single market border be protected. I need to know in terms of the legitimacy of my business, in terms of the competitiveness of my business. So it's a mistake to think that this would be something that, 
This is something that Brussels defends on behalf of the 27. This is not just something, this is not an Irish story. Uh, on the transparency and the tunnel and the contradiction, the transparency was for us a device to fuel the public debate in the 28. Of course, the, not our responsibility in the UK, but we put out information. It was quite remarkable, I think, to what we did in terms of how you looked at how we prepared the future relationship from January till March. I think we put out hundreds and hundreds of slides on the future relationship, which are actually lengthier than the political declaration that we eventually came to. Uh, but when we went in, but that part of it is then also towards our principles, towards our 27 leaders and member states, who then collectively also said, yes, now you go into the tunnel, we accept that, because now you need to strike the final deal, and we trust you as the Commission's team to do that for us, which was a huge expression of trust from the 27 in the negotiation team and in the European Commission, I would say. And we came out of the tunnel with the issues on fisheries and level playing field, and it, it wasn't easy to strike that compromise, as, as people in the panel here uh, clearly know. I think I'll leave it at that. And then the, there was a, a question on the extension. Peter, maybe you'd like to just briefly come in on that. Was it a, was it a good strategy by the, the EU to hand the British this, this two-step deadline? Well, I think the, the, this, is a, this is about blame game at this point, right? So the EU having Donald Tusk slightly run away with himself on the Wednesday before European Council and said, if you don't pass the deal, we're out on the 29th. Um, you know, what the, what the Europeans have done is very, very clearly created a set of steps. They've taken a very legalistic view about the necessity to hold European elections, which I think, you know, I was having conversations several months ago where you didn't have to end up in that place, but the leaders took that view just like they took the view on the backstop. I think it's very hard to see them coming back down from there. Um, there are some, it's one of the reasons why if we get to April the 12th, the glide path to a no deal might be much shorter than some people are expecting. You know, if the leaders are very mindful about creating a space after April the 12th, let's say they give us till the 22nd of May, and the UK then passes it after our own deadline has passed to trigger European elections, and then we have to go back to the EU and go, listen, guys, we have now triggered this election. You can't really deny us our democratic process. Can we, can we have these elections, but just a bit later? We'll still, if you, if you sit the parliament a bit later, say till August, you know, we could, we could push it. Now, you know, if you look at what's happened in the last few months, right, Theresa May did this deal in November. She demanded a European council. She got all the leaders there on a Sunday. And then she... In, you know, embraced the Malthouse Compromise, which was essentially a rip-up of the, of the backstop that she'd negotiated, right? And then she goes to Sharm el-Sheikh and she says, I need this and this and this in from, from, from you, Mr. Juncker. And then she sends Geoffrey Cox there, who starts negotiating on entirely different basis against the backstop that UK lawyers had signed. If you start to wrap all that together, then you start to wonder whether actually the EU wants the headache, you know, wants to to create that space. And that's why I think you, you, will, you will see them setting out those very clear sets of questions where you have to choose now. Vote for it today. If not, okay, you're not, you've, you've ticked off the 25th, 22nd of May. Now you're into a space between now and April the 12th. Can you do EU elections? If you can, and I suspect it'll be hard for the leaders to say no to a longish extension, even if we're not really sure what it's for. Stefan may disagree on that. Um, and if you can't, then we're on a glide path to a no deal, and I think people should be prepared for that glide path to be fairly tight. Would you, would you share that analysis, Sarah? I, I, I absolutely agree, but I do think that it, it will not be so difficult to start to say no since we have been through this whole process. But it could, um, if it is a yes for any further extensions, any longer-term extensions, it will certainly be with an expectation of firm commitments that the UK government has to prove that it can live up to by now. And we should not forget that you know, the, the key issues that the uh, EU governments are concerned about it, when it comes to extension is European Parliament elections is one thing, um, mainly related to their own domestic elections around the European Parliament. Um, but also, as I said previously, around they, a number of them will have um, national elections or regional elections coming up and Brexit is certainly being watched from the continent. People follow um, what, what is being said here. 
But I'd also say that um, there are very important decisions ahead for the EU. There will be preparations, they're already underway for the EU budget. The next uh, multi-annual uh, um, uh, budgetary framework has to be negotiated. If the e uh, UK was to stay in, was it to um, have full voting rights and honour commitments to a next round of, uh, of budget? What would its positions be? It would be extremely um, controversial both here in London but also in Brussels and, and, and EU governments are uh, wary of, the, of that situation. And similarly, other uh, important uh, policy challenges are ahead. So it is not clear that it would be um, immediately in the EU government's uh, interest to simply say, of course, we'll extend. Mm -hmm. There would have to be real commitments and real discussions around such an extension. Mm -hmm. And Faisal, in a, in a sentence, are we heading for European elections? Well, I actually can't see the EU Council, as opposed to the Commission, if the House of Commons clearly indicates that it doesn't want no deal, not finding a way through. Uh, but that would probably involve European parliamentary elections. One tiny question to Stefan, really tiny question to Stefan, which was, you said about MFN tariffs applying. So we face a situation, do we not? Is, that what, is, it, is what you're saying that if we have no deal, tariffs get slapped on and they only go if we sign the withdrawal deal? That's basically what you're saying. No, it's part of a default situation, a no-deal scenario. Then it depends on the UK will then need this to decide... This is basically going to be seen as a trade war. I mean... No, no. This, is, this is part of our global commitments. This is, this is part of global law. Yeah. This is not something we are... This, uh, it, it might have to be a, it might have to be a, a conversation <laughs> that we continue in the coffee break. Uh, so, uh, so I will... Just as I break, we're, uh, we're all, all out of time, so please join me in thanking Sorry. our panellists.